Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our new show across the ocean. My name's James in Miami. And I'm Matthias here in Zurich. And you guys might know us from our own respective channels, Divers Ready and the Matthias Labo channel, but we've come together across the oceans, get it, Miami to Zurich, to bring you guys a new show specifically about underwater cameras, kind of a buying guide and a starting guide for people just looking to get into underwater image making. We're both passionate underwater cinematographers. Mateus is way more experienced than I am in the field, but he's already helped me out so much, bring me up within our own channel here. So I couldn't be more happier than to be collaborating with you. Mate, it's great to see you. Thank you very much. Likewise here, I'm very excited for this collaboration and uh, I'm uh, just very excited to be able to talk about our passions here and share it with as many people as we possibly can and uh, be helpful to people trying to get into the diving or the filming underwater um, for that matter. Now, shall we get right into this first episode, James? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So we're gonna start off where we should start, right? I mean, if we're gonna talk about right getting into underwater cameras, the first thing you need is a camera. Correct, absolutely. You can't film without a camera. So what was your first underwater camera? My very first underwater camera uh, would have probably been a, uh, a, what's the name in English? A, re um, not a reusable, but a one-time use camera. Disposable, yeah. That yeah, disposable camera that um, was a Kodak, one of those old blue ones that worked with proper film still. You remember those days? Um, so I used that for snorkeling in Egypt when I uh, did my very first snorkeling session many, many years back. And uh, yeah, I still remember those, those days very well. Um, really a lot of fun. After that, you had to send in the film, you got it back, and you were quite disappointed with the images that came out of it. You had to wait like a week anything. to get it back, or two weeks sometimes, yeah, I remember. Oh yeah, exactly, exactly. And it didn't resemble anything that you actually saw while snorkeling. So that was my my first experience, I remember, with uh, underwater or in-water cameras. What about you? What was your first in-water camera equipment? Yeah, the same, the same. I think, yeah, either a Kodak or a Fuji film. Uh, I mean, those things were also like, yeah, they're great because you could take photos underwater, which, you know, when you were a child on the beach and you grow up and you do, it, it, it is it is amazing. But I also kind of connect with you on that feeling of disappointment of, of like, you get the photos back and you're like, that didn't look like that. What, what, is, what is this? Um, and the other thing about those things were, obviously we know now with hindsight, but just terrible for the environment. Uh, I mean, they come in a little single-use plastic bag and then the actual camera itself, which all went to the landfill, full of chemicals, uh, absolutely terrible. So I'm not exactly sure what we were doing back then, um, but it was a start. And, that, and then what did you sort oh, yeah. of progress to from that? Uh, well, after that, I started using a uh, actually my first digital camera, which was a, a Canon Ixus, I don't know, something. Um, that had its own underwater housing that was made by Canon itself. And it was a nice and small compact camera and it worked pretty well. I used it a lot for shooting just um, photos on land and then started shooting underwater with it as well. And um, as you said before, luckily we got away from the whole uh, get it and throw it away stuff. Um, so it was uh, obviously, um, there wasn't as much garbage with these kind of things, but still the image was okay for that time. Um, but Again, the disappointment was still always there when looking at the pictures because it just never resembled what you saw underwater. And this is something that has actually progressed or has stayed with me all the way to today. Even now looking at my images, they have obviously improved a lot, but I'm still not quite 100% happy with them because I go like, no, this is not what it looked like. It must look different. <laughs> my this friend, you never will be underwater. satisfied. <laughs> I mean, how I many megapixels now are you shooting? Well, the GH5 has 21, I think, megapixels, but that's not really relevant for the video part of it. And I don't really do a lot of photography underwater. No, but that first camera that you had, that first Canon Digital, I'd be surprised oh, that had, if that was one megapixel. <laughs> that had four megapixels, actually. It was, it was top notch at that time. Oh, mate, you made quite the jump then. Because I had several cameras in between getting to that stage, I had a, I had, I think it was a Kodak actually, and it looked like a banana. 
It looked like a <laughs> it looked like a kid's toy. It was bright yellow with little blue accents, but it did have it, and it was all you know a sealed body design, and then it was still film that you could change the film out. And for some reason, it had the increments of you could do a, a panoramic photo, which was just <laughs> literally a crop at the middle of the photo, nice. slightly enlarged. And then you had like <laughs> a, a couple of different settings. You had like a landscape and a portrait or something like that. And you could select what awesome. size photo you were taking on the outside of the housing. So that was kind of fun to play with. But like I said, you're always sort of disappointed. And I had that and then I went to an Olympus, but like a you know, a very, very sort of cheap, before the Tough series, long time before yeah. the Tough series. But the same thing, Olympus Digital, one megapixel, maybe two megapixels with its own housing. Yeah. It was, you know, the, the, the Olympus branded housing. Sure. Sure. Um, and then from and that- how did that improve? How did that improve your images? Again, not really. You're still you're still disappointed, right? I mean, back then in the days, you were kind of like. I remember. I, 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 I wish I thought about it with nostalgia. I wish I looked back and was like, oh wow, for the time it was really amazing. But now with all the technology we've got these days, it just feels, yeah, just disappointing. It's just like, what were we doing? What were we spending money on back then? You know, um, yeah. it's kind of sad. We should we should be happier. You know. It was the best we could do back then. So I, I agree, we should be happier with the results <laughs> that we got back then. It's like your granddad being disappointed with the first ever television. <laughs> He's like, what Which the hell is this? What do you call this television? Come on, man. <laughs> I, don't, I don't get it. It doesn't even, you know, like, no. It got us started, it, it planted the seed and, you know, we've, had different journeys within diving, but it's it's you know been a massive part of both of our lives for so long, and and we should be thankful absolutely. for that. You know, we absolutely yeah. should. I agree. I don't know what I would do without ever having discovered the the filmmaking and the photography underwater. It's such a big part of my life now and of yours, obviously as well. Yeah. So yeah, yeah I'm absolutely. very thankful for that. So then, did you make the jump from that initial Canon in in the Canon body straight up to pro level gear? Um, kind of. No, I went to a camcorder after that, like, because uh, I decided that I really want to uh, focus more on the video side rather than the photography. So back then there wasn't, I don't think there was any mirrorless cameras or, or uh, compact cameras out there that were able to shoot underwater. It was only like the, the professional DSLRs and they were just very expensive. So I decided to go for a uh, camcorder. I think it was a Sony camcorder. So you can see I'm jumping brands uh, constantly. Yeah. I'm not very loyal to any brand no. really. Um, uh, yeah, so I got that camcorder and started filming with that. Got a dedicated underwater housing. And that's a good story there. This underwater housing was made by a German company and they used carbon fiber to make that housing, which sounds awesome at first. But think about it. Carbon fiber Super doesn't light. have any weight. Yeah. And it was it was a pain having that underwater because I I think I ended up strapping like four kilograms of extra weight onto the housing just to be able to actually keep it underwater. Yeah, because it's just like diving with a balloon it otherwise. It was like a balloon trying yeah. to pull you up to the surface all the time. So uh, that was that was an interesting experience there. And I didn't really use that camcorder for too long. I switched shortly after that to a more professional uh, set of gear that I was using from there. Yeah. What about you? You've been filming with the GoPro for quite a while now, haven't you? Everything on Divers Ready, everything on my channel, up to even date of recording right now, w that's underwater footage was either shot on a GoPro or good old iPhone 10. That's it, everything. 10, I love it. Yeah, yeah, everything on the channel. So been been a fan of GoPro for a long time now. Um, you know, I'm up to the eight. Don't know if I'm gonna make a step yeah. to the nine. I might do because I really wanna see what the 5K looks like underwater. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I've just got a feeling that the low light is still gonna be pretty average. Um, yeah. So we'll, we'll see. Um, but, uh, okay. but yeah, no, I mean, that whole action camera revolution really for me, um, really sort of spurred being able to, you know, take more, it made, it made it made it more accessible. It made it easier for me to take images okay. underwater. And I use it as a tool as well. You know, you're an instructor, I'm an instructor. We, it, it's a really fantastic tool that you can clip off onto your BCD, take it off, mm. take a couple of quick shots of your student, put it back on, forget about it, and then come up and after the dive, 
do a video debrief and be like, look, you see how your knees are slightly dropping there? You need to bring those yeah. knees up and get them, you know, more in, uh, and things like that. You can actually show them what they look like. So I, I used it like that. And then I have, you know, a holster for it on my BCD, on my on my harness. And it just, it, it lives there and I use it all the time. So. Um, That's awesome. And, and you've played so you with the- So you do that a lot? Do you, do you film your students a lot? Yeah. Yeah, I do. And unless it's um, prohibited by my agency, which it is at open water yeah. level, you're not allowed yeah. to uh, have a camera with SDI at open water level. Um, yeah. But any other course, if there's not a restriction on it, absolutely. Yeah, I find it's a it's a great diagnostic tool where you can just take mm, a video of them underwater, put the camera away, that's it. I'm not filming for the channel. I'm not filming for anything else. Just take yeah. a couple of quick shots of them and then, you know, show them immediately on the, download the footage straight to your phone and then mm. immediately should give them video feedback. That's what I like to do. That's awesome. See, this is so interesting how education in diving has changed over the years. I mean, I've been an instructor for quite some years, but I haven't really done a lot of instructing in recent years, ever since I returned back to Switzerland, especially the last, let's say five years, I haven't done a lot of instructing. But back when I was really, really uh, busy instructing and working as a full-time instructor, um, I, the technology was just not there for us to film our students underwater. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, a couple of uh, months back, I uh, put out a video on my channel where I brought up this discussion, um, should we film our students underwater? That was the question, the title of the video. Because um, when I learned to ski, and I know this is gonna be a surprise, I'm Swiss and I only just learned to ski last winter, I know. <laughs> But when I learned to ski last winter, my skiing instructor actually filmed me while I was coming down the slopes. And it was so useful to me getting that footage afterwards and seeing myself and actually understanding what I was yeah. doing wrong and what I was doing right. He was only filming you because he was hoping you were going to wipe out and then he could share the video with his friends. And I was a few times. Yeah. Though. Yeah. And uh, it was good fun. You know, it's a good thing when you're not so tall like myself. When you fall, you don't fall very high. Yeah. Um, so so let, let's dive into action cameras then, because that, yes, please. It, let's be honest, if, if you're watching this and you're thinking about buying your first underwater camera, most likely for your money, your best bet is an action camera, either a GoPro or a faux pro or Paralens, which is coming into the market, which I know you've reviewed on your channel yeah. um, uh, extensively with, with all the different sort of options and that kind of stuff. What, what is your pick right now? Uh, for the action camera segment? I would probably choose a GoPro, the GoPro 9, the new one that has just come out. Um, I have been a big supporter of the Paralens cameras. I do really like them. I think they're fantastic as an, uh, an entry level um, underwater camera, but specifically underwater. And that's where I see also the, the largest drawback because they are only an underwater camera. Yeah. They're not really usable on land. So if you're looking for a camera that um, you might want to use um, also on land and for other action sports, the Paralens is not for you. You're much, much better off getting a GoPro, getting an extra housing for underwater, and then you're a lot more flexible with that. So Absolutely, yeah, and, and price-wise as well, like even a GoPro with the dive housing or the super suit, or whatever they're calling it these days, sure. is still a lot cheaper than just the Paralens, which, yeah, you don't need a housing for it, it's waterproof out of the box. Yeah. But still, there's there's a significant price difference. I think like it's it's 150 percent the cost. I think the Paralens over a GoPro setup for diving yeah. at the moment, even with the new one with the nine. So it'd be interesting to see what they do with the Vaquita coming out. Um, I know you're pushing really hard, Paralens. Get this man a Vaquita so you can test it out. Let's do it. I've been waiting for so long. You, you, you know, you touch on a good point there with the GoPros. I was like. We took ours to the Bahamas, we were strapping it to a golf cart at wheel level and like bombing around the island, doing time lapses and stuff. And, you know, um, put it on my mountain bike, going downhill trails and stuff. And they just, they just, for that, if if all you want a camera for is diving and you're covered with, with other aspects of filming in your life, then sure, look at the Paralens for the fact that it's got a computer built in. I've got a dive computer on my wrist. I don't really need one in my camera. Um, and it's not something that if you're going to mount it, you're going to be using that information from the from the computer in real time anyway. You're not going to be using it for your actual dive profile because you can't see it. It's strapped to your head or maybe you've got it handheld, right. but then you put it away and then you don't have a dive computer with you. So you're still always going to dive with a with a dive computer. So those features to me don't really appeal. 
Um, you know, I don't really care what depth the video was taken at specifically, unless I'm doing like a mapping project. I just want the video to look good. So yeah, exactly. kind of yeah. feel that same yeah, way. I All right. I think we should also talk about if we're coming into um, people buying their first cameras, let, let's talk about best in budget, right? Let's, yeah, I, sure. I'd be interested to hear your uh, best camera setup for underwater filmmaking, under 500, under a thousand, under five thousand. Let's say. All Would right. that work? Okay. Yeah, we can do that for sure. Yeah. So with the under five hundred category, I would I would pick the GoPro. Yeah. Um, because I don't think there is any other camera under five hundred that delivers results that are reaching up to the GoPro quality of image that you can get. Yes, you mentioned it before, it is low light. Uh, it's not a low light beast and it, trouble, it has troubles shooting in low light. But let's be honest, most of the time, um, the nicest image is always going to be collected in shallow water. Yeah. So when you're on a nice tropical coral reef with lots of reef fish, um, a lot of sunshine coming in, trying to dive around midday when you have a lot of sunshine, when it's entering the water uh, straight from the top. and the GoPro is going to be just fine there, really. Yeah. Um, so I would say 500, up to 500 GoPro. I'm guessing you're going with the same or do you have another option? Yeah, no, I go with the same. I think I think for $500, you can get the GoPro, you can get the dive housing. And you're, uh, in the US, at least pricing wise, you'd probably have about 150 bucks still left over to put towards a light or a tray or, or whatever you wanted to do. So I think, I think exactly. definitely for that. You know, um, honorable mention would probably be the Olympus TG. I think you can get the camera only for that, which is good to 33 feet, 10 meters. Yeah. So if you're just doing shallow diving, you could probably get away with that. But yeah, no, GoPro would be my pick for sure. What about under a thousand? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the thousand one, I would, in this category, I would probably go for the um, TG6, the Olympus TG6 with the housing. Uh, the Olympus housing um, and I'm not too current on the pricing on that one but I think that's gonna be sort of very close to the $1,000 mark if you have anything left over you can still use that money to get maybe a wet lens um, yeah. a macro lens or a wide angle lens something like that or even a cheaper light that is gonna um, help you achieve better colors when filming underwater too or get a a red filter or something like that for your um, TG6. So, um, yeah, yeah. What about you? What's your pick? I think I would go with Sea Life. Uh, they have a package right now that has camera. I mean, they've been doing underwater imaging. That's their specialty. Uh, you know, they've got custom white balance, all the bells and whistles. They make, you know, filters that are, that are native. Uh, and you can get like the DC 2000 setup right now, which is camera. I think it's 18 megapixels. It does 4K at 30 uh, frames okay. per second. Uh, nice. It comes with a tray, an arm, and a video light for a thousand bucks for for a dollar shy of that's a thousand bucks. Not too bad. It's pretty decent if you, particularly if you're into video. I think that's probably a really really decent option to look at for that price point. Point. So that, that sounds pretty cool. What about the, the video light? Do you know how um, what the power output is in that one? I don't off the top of my head. It's it's a Sea Life branded video light. Um, like I said, okay. it comes all, all as the same package in in the same box. Um, but no, I don't know. But it, I mean, it, it looks pretty decent, pretty chunky. I got my hands on one at Dima last year, um, but I don't remember the specs off the top of my head. Okay. I just I remember being. I, I, I remember holding it and thinking, for a thousand bucks, this is a lot of camera. Yeah. you know yeah for, for what we'd use that it sounds, for sounds interesting i need to see if i can get my hands on one of these and give them a bit of a test spin it would be quite interesting to see how it performs here yeah. in switzerland in colder water yeah and, and definitely good for, you know for your channel as well like to have more on the entry level stuff you know um absolutely we, we talk about that all the time when it comes to content i think that's important so you know yeah being accessible to the viewer you guys absolutely um, all right, so let's not be accessible then. Let's say $5,000. Oh, so we're going nearly all in then. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, well, 
this, this is not a secret. I'm going to pick the GH5 yeah. the GH5S. That's the camera that I'm using currently for anything that I film underwater. And you are just on that verge of making that progression, as I understand. Yeah, well, we've been shooting on the GH5 in the studio for a while now. Um, but yes, I'm, I'm about to pull the trigger on the housing. Um, I'm not going to get away with under uh, five grand for sure, because I've got the, uh, the you know, the video monitor and and a bunch of different lens options and that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, we're about to make a big investment to to get the housing set up for, for the GH5. Mm -hmm. Agree with you, like completely happy with the GH5 in terms of, you know, the video specs are unreal for the price of the camera. The actual GH5 here in the States has come down considerably because I presume either there's a GH6 coming out or they're focusing more mm -hmm. on their, you know, full frame range with the S1 and the S5 or whatever it is um, yep. that, that's just coming out. So the price is coming down the GH5, but it's still a phenomenal camera. It's still got amazing, you know, video specifications. Um, and you can get cheaper housings than the one that we bat around with. You know, you can <laughs> you can get a decent housing for it, brand new for under two grand. The bo the yep. body, I think, with the with the lens kit is is two two right now. So that puts you at like four thousand two hundred, and then you've got eight hundred to play with. So. Yeah, I think under under five grand, it's hard to beat. I mean, the next camera up from the GH5 is the Canon, you know, 1DX Mark II, which is insane money to get the same, you know, 4K. All right, that's full frame, and but same still. Quality. Yeah, plus the, the codex that the 1DX Mark IV or whatever it is puts out, it's just not really, really user friendly. I've yeah. played around with that video footage on my computer that I used to edit the 10-bit footage from the GH5, uh, it, it's not user-friendly. It, it's a terrible codex that they have on the 1D, uh, um, on, on the Canon camera. It's just not very nice. Brutal, yeah. yeah. Editing's taking yeah. for ages. So, so let's say we, we are at 4,200 with the setup that you described before. Sure. What would you get for the additional $800? Lights, yeah. I'd get a couple, yeah. of, uh, couple of solars from Light and Motion. That's my go-to lighting brand for video lights. Nice, soft okay. diffusion, you know. I don't have that mad Swiss Keldon money. <laughs> he said while uh, drinking coffee. Me, he subtly drops that into the conversation while drinking coffee. <laughs> <laughs> the, ones, the ones that I've uh, been using in the past, I don't know, couple of weeks, they're not mine. I don't, I don't own any Keldon lights yet. Yeah, but I'm I'm really hooked now that I've tried them. I don't want to go back to anything else. But I've got some really good lights that I can recommend for. Um, I think they're like four or five hundred dollars each. They're Orca Torch. I don't know if you know the company. Yes, I do. Yes. Um, yeah. They're like um, I don't remember the model name of it, but it's their five thousand lumen video light, which is very easy to use and has a very very nice um, light output. Really. Okay. So, I would, I would, yeah, I would probably go with that. How's the color? To start off with. Um, about 5,800, I think. Oh, okay, be. cool. So pretty good. Yeah, yeah, yeah bringing that, yeah, bringing it up above daylight. Yeah, a little bit, yeah. And uh, and they have a very, very even and natural looking, um, you know, um, light beam. So you don't have any hot spots in there or anything like that. Nice. It gradually just goes um, to the edges. It's really nice. Yeah, I enjoyed that light. Awesome, man. Awesome. Yeah. Killer. Killer. Good stuff. Right. What do you so, think? So, um, I think we've got one topic left for today. Shoot. And that's, in my opinion, that's probably one of the most important ones and probably one that people um, are most curious about to hear our opinion. When should you start taking cameras with you underwater? Now, this is... Yes. Okay, let's... You take the point, the uh, point of view of an instructor, and I look at it from a underwater filmmaker's point of view. Yeah, I mean, from from the instructor's point of view, um, you want to make sure that you're putting out good, competent divers, right? So at the end of your open water course, you're not trying to teach in four dives or five dives, however many you get with your instructor, everything about diving. You're just trying to make somebody safe, and then release them like a baby chicken out into the into the universe, right? And hopefully a sparrow hawk doesn't come down and give them the bends, you know? But you're just trying to create them and nurture them and get them through the basics and give them some understanding, and then you release them. But they're not yeah. a finished product 
at that point. And, you know, I've had students, of course, that say, hey, I've got a GoPro because I ski, because I mountain bike. Can I bring it diving with me? Can I bring it on my open water course? Absolutely not. No, no. You need to be focused on learning what we're there to teach you initially. And then I would go on and say, also go out and do 10, 15 dives after your open water course and really work to polish your proficiency in the fundamentals. I bang on about them all the time on Divers Ready, buoyancy, breathing, trim, propulsion. Get those four things down and then start adding a camera into a mix. Because really for me, when you bring a camera underwater, it becomes a distraction from everything else that diving is about. And then the camera becomes the focus of the dive. So yeah. as long as you can do those four things competently and subconsciously, you're not continuously thinking about your buoyancy control and you know, you're know you not constantly on your inflator, then you'll have time and freedom to start exploring video making. It's gonna make you a better, safer diver. You're gonna enjoy the camera uh, or the image making process more because it's not gonna be like something else you're struggling with while you're still trying to learn to dive. Um, so my answer really is like, not right away. Don't, don't do it like straight out of your open water course if you can avoid it, you know? I know you're keen to capture it and show your friends what you're seeing and all that kind of good stuff. And that's all cool, but just, you know, take a little minute, I think. What, do, what are your thoughts? Do you agree or disagree? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. When I was still actively teaching, I used to say to my students, give yourself, I said 50 dives. Okay. Get your first 50 dives under your belt get your confidence underwater as you said in particular the buoyancy part is so important to me because I've like when I was guiding um, photography divers underwater photo underwater photographers yeah man you I mean you've seen it you've seen it all but how these some people act underwater to get the perfect shot and don't care about their buoyancy crashing on coral smashing yeah. the reef harassing marine life it's terrible yeah and I think you need to you need to grow an appreciation for the marine life and the marine environment first, and that can only be done by diving more and yeah. seeing more stuff underwater. And then you'll get to a point where you go, okay, fine, I've seen now quite a bit or a, a fraction of what is um, there to be seen underwater. Now it's time for me to start showing this um, to other people that might not be as fortunate as us uh, who can go diving. Yeah, 100% so, agree with that. 100% agree with that, with the exception of I think 50 dives is savage. You've got to bear in mind, I don't think that, well, for a fact, most divers never even reach 50 dives in their whole career. Yeah. You know, um, so I think I think that's that's tough. But, I know, but, but you're I a know, tough but guy. You've know, you you always it. got to set the bar, you've got to set the bar very high, and it's People are just not going to go for that high bar. They're going to go for somewhere around the middle. Yeah, okay. So if I said it at 50, they'll be, yeah, he said 50, but come on, it's going to be okay with 25. Yeah, you're if right. If I say 20, <laughs> they're going to go, well, he said 20, it's okay with five. Yeah, yeah, no, right? you're right. That was my intention of setting that bar. I was like, damn, 50 dives. I'm like, you know, <laughs> I'd be interested to know, actually, out of all the students you've ever taught and all the students I've ever taught, how many of them have gone on, like, I mean, open water classes that we've taught, how many of them have gone on to reach 50 dives? That'd be kind of interesting, but that's the topic for a different kind of show. <laughs> can you can you pull that statistic from somewhere? No, no, you've got no way of, not I mean, really, right? not without no, picking not up the phone, calling anyway. all your ex-students and asking them how many dives they've got. Well, That'd be gonna, a tough that's one. That's gonna take a long time. Yeah, yeah, it's gonna take a while. <laughs> <laughs> well, a topic for another day. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, what are we going to talk about on the next one? And by the way, guys, this is going to be a monthly show. So this is this is what you're seeing right now. This is the Matthias and James show across the ocean. We, I'm going to get up early and call Matthias once a month, brew up a big pot of coffee, and we're just going to talk about cameras. Um, next month, you're going to host the show on your channel, Matthias Labo channel. Uh, and right. what are we talking about? We we'll talk about Christmas because it's December, the month of December, and we'll talk about what our wish lists for Christmas. So I'm going to share with you guys what is on my wish list for this Christmas. Camera gear talking, all right? And I want to know from you, James, what is on your wish list for uh, this Christmas when it comes to cameras. All right. And I've got a fairly good idea what might be on that list. Yeah, I've got a few things coming up for sure. But uh, all right, great. So kind of a gift guide. Absolutely. Yeah, cool. Good stuff. Um, so there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. That's pretty much what you're looking at. We're going to uh, 
We're gonna keep this going on a monthly basis, like I said, and we're gonna alternate the work. This is how it's gonna happen. So I'm taking charge of this month's edit, so apologies in advance for that. Uh, but this video will live on, no on my needed. channel, Dive is Ready, and then Mateus will also share it through all of his channels and platforms. And then next month, December 2020, uh, Mateus is gonna take the lead and do the editing and the, that video will live on his channel. And then we will create Absolutely. playlists for both channels that have all the videos you can watch them through and the whole thing. But I uh, hope you guys enjoy it. We really wanna kind of just share with you our enthusiasm for underwater image making. Sure, and if I may just say a last word, James, um, if you guys have any topics that are of special interest to you, please, please, please share them with us down in the comment section below. We're more than happy to pick those topics up and throw them in the discussion around here and see what we can come up with uh, in the discussions that we have here. Yeah, particularly if you have any issues shooting underwater, if there's any challenges that you have that you're looking for a solution for, we'd be happy to troubleshoot with you guys, so for sure. But I'm just super happy that we we get to do this, Mateus. I'm really really happy, uh, Mateus. Same and I, here, if you, absolutely. If, yeah. If you don't know, we've never met each other. We've we've become friends through this awesome digital space that we co-inhabit here on YouTube. I've uh, been a big fan of Mateus' channel. I've personally learned so much about filming for Divers Ready from Mateus' channel, uh, and to Thank be able to so collaborate much. with you, mate, is is an absolute pleasure. Likewise, I uh, couldn't agree more. I'm really looking forward that we have uh, uh, finally started doing this and I can't wait to see where it's gonna take us. And also, I actually can't wait, James, to meet you yeah. in person, which is gonna happen uh, next, next summer. year. Next summer. Yeah. Because you're flying through Zurich and I'm gonna take you on a little sightseeing tour while you're here and show you my city of Zurich here. I can't you, wait. I uh, got your lay over here, I can't wait. It's gonna be awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us for this episode one of Across the Oceans. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to both myself and Matthias's channels, both of which are linked in the description of this video below. And we'll look forward to seeing you next month where we'll be sharing more hints and tips for capturing your best underwater image. And in the meantime, head out there and capture some amazing underwater footage. And this- Thank you very much for watching. And this and was your Across the Oceans for this week, for this <laughs> month. No, hang on, let me do that again. I don't know what else we wanna, oh. do you wanna end it with anything Should I else? I say something? <laughs> I don't know. Can we do this well, again? Well, it's weird for me because I normally end it dive safe, dive often, but that would be like the diver's ready no, stamp. No, we can do that. Dive safe, dive often, start filming. No, that's, no that, that doesn't work. Okay. <sighs> okay. Dive safe, dive often. No, it's all right, don't no, worry, I'll edit say, this and make it look good. You can say dive safe, you can say dive safe, dive often, and I'll just go and we'll see you in the next one. Okay. I'll, I'll do the preamble of the outro and then you just kill it. Just knock it out of the park, just <laughs> And she's gone! Okay, I'll see what I can do. All right. All right, let's try. Oh, that's my clue, shit. shit. Hang on, we'll, we'll cut that.